So, hi everyone, and welcome to this presentation about game development development. So it's, it's not really a typo, it's like a meta thing we do at King to improve the lives of our game developers. Uh, so I work at King, a game company, and uh, so for this past year I have been working together with Mike on this project. Um, and uh, I'm, before I will move into what we have actually done, I would like to give you some uh, context and background in case you're not familiar with uh, game development. So I would like to demo this engine that we make at King called The Fold. Um, it's not Eclipse. It's the game editor you're seeing here, built on Eclipse using Java. And this is also publicly available. So if you are interested, contact me afterwards, and I will set you up uh, with access for it. But so here I have opened a game. So you see the game files over here to the left. And I can just, from this editor, I can start this. And so this is a game by King that was released uh, two weeks ago or so. So you see, the game is now running inside of the game engine. So this is a different program. It's the implemented in C++, so it's uh, faster and uh, easily more uh, you know, cross-platform and these things. So I can come back here into the editor and inspect the files. So it's similar to an IDE, but it also has this ability to, to let me see what I'm working on. So the, the cue thing here is to uh, let the developer see instantly what they make, the effects, and so on. So I can also... Uh, load the GUI file here. So this is the top uh, layer you see here. And I can also come in here, uh, modify it, change that, and then you see that it uh, updates in the game. So this would also work if it's running on a mobile phone or something. So the, the real thing here is to um, let everyone be as quick as possible and interactively make their games. And of course, a game consists of many, many files, data files, source files, and so on. So the, the problem here in this editor is really to um, check all these dependencies and make sure that whenever a file is changed that the using files are changed and so on. So that's a big thing of this, uh, this problem. So this talk is not about the engine, I'll kill that. Um, it's about this software. So it seems to be working, it seems good. People can use it to make their games and you can ship the games and so on. So uh, that should be good, right? Well, no, nah, it's, it's not really good for us who makes it. Uh, and I will describe more, more about that later, but so the decision here was to throw this away, this application, and just completely re-implement it from scratch. And why? Um, we ship bugs, nothing we're proud of, but um, we do the, all this stuff for, uh, to catch the bugs uh, before we ship anything, and it's anything from design processes, uh, automated testing, manual regression testing, um, all these things we constantly, we have very good test coverage, but somehow these bugs still are shipped. And the reason for that is that we have lots of duplicated state in the software, mostly to uh, make it responsive and, and performant, uh, but also because that's a fact uh, when you're using Eclipse and SWT and you deal with native widgets and so on. You can't be wasteful with them. You have to uh, synchronize the state and make sure the application stays up to date. We also tend to repeat ourselves. And, and by this I mean that whenever there's a dependency, so something is dependent on something else, uh, that is solved right there, often by registering a listener, uh, checking for file system events, and then filtering through them, looking for this specific thing. When that happens, do arbitrary Java logic as a response to that. So how should this be presented to the user and let them see what, what's happened? It means that the code amount is sort of proportional to the amount of dependencies we add. Uh, and as you all know, that's really a bad place to be in. Uh, so we have the increase in complexity, we get slower and slower in introducing new features, and we come to sort of a dead end, um, where it's just mentally challenging to do anything here without breaking. Uh, in the end, we want our users to be able to extend this platform, so they might make a game-specific level editor or something like that, and to let them do that in the light of everything I said is mostly unethical, like you can't really put your users in that situation. We have to make something better here and let people be you know, more uh, effective. And, and also for ourselves, of course. We also want to be able to change this software and, and make that better. So the goals uh, when doing this from scratch would be to solve things in the architecture as much as possible. So all these problems I talked about, to solve them once and for all and have everyone else use them rather than having to implement them. We have a lot of problematic data dependencies in an application like this. And, a strange example is that the title bar of the application window happens to be dependent on the project settings file. 
And the only reason for that is that that file happens to store the name of the project. And that name we need to show to the user in the title bar. So you have these dependencies that seems to go from one end of the application to the next. And we just have to allow that, like treat that as something that's natural to the system. We also do a lot of heavy computations. So that would be maybe uh, texture compressions or bin packing problems or uh, just sorting the data and uh, optimize it in different ways. And as I said, we really want to bring the build times below a second so that the user can just launch the games and change it and launch and change it. Um, and that means we, we are happy to waste the memory of the uh, computer rather than having the CPU go at each time. So store them, and as, as long as they're constant, the input parameters are constant, we like to reuse them. So quickly fetch them from memory. Um, in the game engine, we also have live development going on. So uh, the game developers use Lua to script their games, and then they can like, upload the new code into the running game, and, and that's a really, really good thing. And we also w want to bring that over to tool development. So you can imagine something like Emacs or Smalltalk happening here, like you would code this editor inside of itself, and it would respond to the new code happening and have that kind of you know, nice, creative way of, of developing. So uh, I'm talking about a graph of dependencies. One idea would be to use a graph to model that problem. Like That seems like a really good uh, first idea uh, to change here. And also state problems. So the, the functional people, they always talk about how they don't have state problems. So that's really you know, curious for us uh, who deal with them every day. And closure seems like a very good approach to this. And since we are used to Java and that whole platform, that's, that's also a nice fit for us. And Yelp, uh, that's help in Swedish. Um, <laughs> we don't know closure, so uh, we need help from someone. And it seems like Cognitech knows a bit of uh, closure. So uh, we sort of contacted them and asked them, can you please, please help us in this and make this graph architecture that we can use to, to build our application on top of. So before uh, letting Mike describe this architecture and what uh, Cognitech has been doing, I'd just like to give you a glimpse um, of the new Dark uh, editor. Uh, by popular request, game developers tend to like Dark applications. Um, so this is a, a small, um, very small game, just to, to show um, some dumbing in it. So it sort of works. It's still the same game engine running now as we saw before. Oh, shit, I suck. Um, but um, now it's been produced by this new software. So if we go back here, this is basically uh, all of it written in, in Clojure um, with some JavaFX on top to do, do the widgets. So I can still come in here, uh, load this stuff, check out the little frog uh, hero, and maybe make a copy of him, maybe move that to the side, and then running. Again, we now have his uh, identical twin. So that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it didn't work really well there. But um, <laughs> uh, So uh, it means that the application now sort of behaves like the old one. It looks a bit different, but it acts very much like the old one. And so for the users, it will be a nice transition once it's done. But it's, it's, uh, it's getting there. We, we have still struggling with you know, learning uh, closure as imperative programmers and stuff like that, but we're, we're uh, making good uh, ground anyway. OK, um, over to you. OK, so uh, Ragnar talked about the graph. And uh, in game development, the idea of a scene graph is pretty natural. Uh, you have objects that are related to their parents, so they have an offset from their parent. They need to be translated together. Uh, when we were talking about the graph, we thought maybe we could extend this idea even farther and have the graph actually uh, reach into the UI. So we not only have the scene graph of all the game assets and, and the dependencies among them, but the graph, the graph is everything. The graph is life. The graph is speed. Um, We've built an in-memory transactional data flow graph. Uh, it starts pretty simply. You know, we're just representing this as closure data structures. We haven't done anything on disk. Uh, the on-disk assets are still the same game assets they were before. They're largely represented in text, so they diff nicely and they go into git nicely. Um, and the, the references in the text are in terms of strings. As we load things, we turn those string references into graph connections. Um, so we have this flattened representation of the graph. You can see we've got uh, nodes that are indexed by their ID. Um, and then we've got 
uh, SARCs and TARCs, those are the source arcs and target arcs. Uh, for some performance reasons, it became useful to represent each arc in the graph twice, once indexed by its head and once indexed by its tail. Uh, and then successors and transaction ID, uh, it's a little bit of bookkeeping, again, a performance optimization uh, where we're just pre-calculating and caching some values. <clears throat> Every node in the graph uh, essentially follows this same uh, basic schema. We have outputs from the graph that are produced by production functions. Outputs are labeled with a keyword name and they're typed according to the type of value that they produce. Uh, inputs likewise are labeled and typed. There's one additional bit of info on an input, which is it may be an array input or a single input. If it's an array input, then it can have many connections coming into it. If it's a single input, it can only have one. Nodes have properties, which are uh, just intrinsic to the node. Uh, properties also act as outputs. So when we look at uh, the definition of a node, um, we can get its outputs by calling node value. And that triggers a tree of computation. So when I call node value on an output, I probably need to run a production function. But in order to call that production function, I need to supply it with its dependencies, which I get from properties of the node itself, other outputs on the node, or inputs to the node. And if I want to go get an input to the node, that may trigger me calling a production function on an upstream node. So you can imagine this sort of bifurcating tree of computation when I pull on a single output node. All modifications to the graph happen by calling a transaction. Uh, you build a transaction and you invoke it. The transaction uh, until you invoke it is just data. So it's very easy to look at a set of transaction steps and say, this is creating a node, this is connecting a node, this is changing a property. Um, one sort of uh, basic kind of UI response is here. Uh, this is handling a, a, an input, and you can see there are some calls to node value. Uh, here we're uh, asking the view what its play mode is. Uh, we're asking the view what the selected updatables are. Uh, these are outputs on the view. Uh, and then we build a transaction here by concatting together the output of these set property calls. Now set property, it sounds very imperative and side effecty. Again, it's just returning transaction step that will actually set the property when we do the transaction. To make defining the nodes easier on the end users, uh, the end users being the, the game developers who are using this IDE, we defined a language for defining the nodes. Um, and this is what we expect to be the main means of extension. There are uh, currently 78 different node types in the editor. Most of those represent game assets or fragments of game assets, but uh, some of them also represent components in the UI itself. So here is uh, one example of a def node. This would be uh, when you're editing a Lua script or something along those lines, we create a node to represent that uh, text editing area. You can see one of the properties on this node is actually a text area. So the, the type of that property is a Java class, and it gets instantiated and held at that property. We have these inputs um, that uh, tell us where to get the code from and uh, where the cursor is. And then we have an output, which is this new content. Uh, this is calling a production function update text area. In the definition of that function, we would see how update text area depends on its inputs. This particular output is cached, which means uh, we're going to hold on to the output value until one of its dependencies changes. This is a more uh, complex example of a node. So uh, when packing textures into uh, a large texture map, you also need to keep track of uh, where all the coordinates of your original images landed in the texture map. That's the job of an atlas. It also brings together animation loops. So when you have, uh, in, in one of the tutorials, a spinning spaceship made up of eight uh, PNGs, uh, the animation group says, cycle through the PNGs in this order at this many frames per second, uh, and you know, loop or ping pong forward and back or play once and stop or, or so on. Uh, and so you can see here we have uh, several more inputs to the Atlas node. It extends or inherits the resource node, so we create a notion of uh, subtyping. And uh, 
Yeah, don't tell anyone, but we're actually doing multiple inheritance, and it's working OK. Um, and then we have a number of typed outputs, some of which are cached, uh, some of which uh, present uh, a multiple output, like this image where you can get uh, a collection of images. Others say any, which is our wildcard type. Uh, that's the one that says, I can't be bothered to define the type right now, uh, or I actually want to allow any kind of input. Usually it's more of the former than the latter. This is the node definition for the Atlas node. Same exact thing, just translated into text. A couple of points of interest to call out. Um, if you take a look at some of these production functions, you'll see this GFNK business here. Uh, G is just our alias to our namespace. FNK is actually the prismatic plumbing keyword function. So when you look at an FNK, uh, you don't just get the arg list of sort of positions where arguments can go, you actually get the names. We use those names. So when this FNK says animations, that's expressing a dependency. To call this function, you have to supply it with the animations. Well, where do we find animations? In this case, it's an input. So this says, before I can call uh, the images production function and get back my array of images, I have to collect the animations and uh, supply them to the function. You can see here another one, this one for GPU texture, uh, it takes an underscore name, which are all sort of magic IDs, and it takes texture set data as an input. We don't find that in our inputs or properties, but we do find that as another output of the same node. So we have this ability to chain the outputs of the node. Here's a longer production function that actually has uh, you know, many dependencies and it uh, returns a record uh, with all of that stuff bundled into a record. So again, uh, as the writer of the node type, you don't necessarily care at this moment whether frames is a property or an input or another output. You don't care whether FPS is a property or an input or another output. You just say, for this function, I need to know what the FPS is. And the plumbing inside the, the graph itself supplies those to you. So I talked about transactions. Uh, it should be familiar if anyone's used Datomic. It's the same exact idea. Uh, we were heavily inspired by Datomic, I'll say. Uh, that sounds a lot better than copying the design, doesn't it? Um, so atomic state advancement, and it's the only way to change state. Uh, you build up your transaction data. Uh, one point uh, that we found important on this one was the ability to build up a nested collection. So it can be a vector with vectors with vectors uh, on down. Uh, and the reason for that is if you try to make a flattened collection, then your code structure has to match that kind of flattened structure. But if you allow a nested collection of transaction steps, then you can kind of uh, compose all of your transaction creating code in an arbitrary way in whatever's natural for the structure of your code. So uh, the structure of the code and the uh, transaction uh, can be isomorphic because you know, we're, we're agnostic to the nesting there. Now transactions are mostly pure functions. So underneath the covers we've got this transact star function. Uh, it, this is exactly the code for transact star. Uh, it works as a pipeline of steps that takes this transaction context and a bunch of actions and works its way through and eventually returns to you the transaction result. One of the components of this transaction result is the, uh, the new basis, which is like the updated world value, uh, along with some status information and some uh, bookkeeping information that we can use for other important tasks that I'll show in a second. So our, our basic life cycle here is we have a graph, we apply a transaction, and we get a new graph. That graph uh, can produce all the values that we need for the UI, but it doesn't push them through. I talked about pulling on uh, outputs, and that's, that's the model. It's pull-based, not push-based. Uh, so we update the GUI controls by pulling all these outputs and painting the screen and updating the GUI controls. The GUI then does its GUI thing and somehow translates you know, user gestures into GUI events. Those GUI events then uh, create more transactions. And so because we've got this loop that's mediated by the transaction, uh, we're not attaching a bunch of listeners all over the place. And one of the nice things about that is it gets us away from one of the key problems of, of GUIs, which is mutability 
uh, and event storms. So when I have GUIs with listeners pointing in every direction, it's really common to have one uh, widget trigger an event that causes the other one to update itself, which also triggers an event which hits this one, and, uh, and suddenly you're at 100% CPU and you don't quite know why. Uh, so we don't have that because you know, we're in a closer to pure functional uh, state management system. Now I did look around for any purely functional GUIs. Uh, I found some research uh, dating back you know, a decade or more, but really everything today is kind of single threaded and mutable and based on the widget toolkit idea. One of the features that we wanted to build into the architecture was undo and redo. So the typical way of, of doing this is the command pattern. Uh, you build an object that represents how to apply a delta to your state, uh, and it has a method to sort of unapply or work backwards. And then you build a stack of these commands. They suffer from a couple of big problems. Uh, one, when you make your change, it may cause side effects that you as the programmer aren't aware of, especially if you allow extension by end users. So when you do the unapply, you don't know what all has happened in your environment to fully unapply your command. So we actually just keep a record of all the states. Every time there's a transaction, we advance this paper tape idea and write a new state into it. If we want to undo, we back up the paper tape. Uh, and if we want to redo, we go forward. Now, if you undo, we've built up some forward or future history in this redo log. Uh, if you then do something else, we just drop the future history. So you've, you've gone back in time, killed your grandfather, and you're on a new timeline. <laughs> there was one other subtlety about undo and redo that has to do with caching. Uh, and I, I'm going to come back to that because first I have to explain how we do caching. So uh, to the node developer, cache looks like just a little keyword that you can attach to your production function. Uh, which is fantastic because we've actually solved caching, right? One of the two biggest unsolved problems in computer science, naming caching and off by one errors, and we solved caching. <laughs> well, we can do that because we know when state changes, it changes in a transaction, and we have this graph that tells us all the dependencies. When we look at an FNK for a production function, we know exactly what it uses. And so we can do this tracing forward when we say, you know, if this, uh, if this property changes, we can trace forward through the graph. So we have two directions we can go. We pull a value, which propagates computation backward through the graph, or we make a change, which propagates invalidation forward through the graph. And we also treat topology changes as a, uh, a cache invalidating change. So if you connect something new to an input or you disconnect an input, uh, you know, we consider that sufficient cause to say anything dependent on that input is probably going to update. Well, caching and transactions and evaluation all kind of happening at the same time has some subtleties. Uh, and, and for here, I really thank Sam Umbach, one of my colleagues, for writing about 100 different tests that all demonstrated inconsistencies in evaluation. Um, so for example, one of them, I'm doing a computation, and I'm working my way backward through the graph, and somebody does a transaction in the middle of that. Well, now some of my computation is based on the values at the beginning, and some of my computation is based on the values at the end. Uh, no good. Uh, many other scenarios, like I, I do a computation that branches and reconverges. Re I want to only compute that value once. I don't want to get it from two different time steps. And so uh, we created this idea of an evaluation context. And so when we're pulling a node value, we create this evaluation context that captures the state of the world at the beginning uh, in the form of this basis. It captures the state of the global cache at the beginning in the form of the cache snapshot. And then in the local snapshot, it keeps a record of any new cacheable values that were created during that computation. So whenever we're looking for a value, we first look in the local cache, then we look in the snapshot, then we look at the basis. We don't refer back to the current state of the world uh, because that could be changing under us. So I'm gonna hand it back over so Ragnar can talk about how we employ this in practice. 
Yes, um, thank you, Mike. And uh, so in this example, I'm showing a bunch of production functions working in, in uh, combination. So the point here is to take the atlas, which Mike talked about. It's the collection of many images being composed into one large texture and showing that to the user. So first of all, we need to uh, collect all the image data. That's production functions. Then it needs to lay them out, uh, the bin packing problem, essentially. Uh, that's a separate production function. It takes all these results, pack that into a scene data structure. The scene data structure uh, tells the rendering system how this specific thing should be rendered. The scene view is the uh, actual JavaFX view that we render in the middle. So that just passes off the scene data it receives uh, over away onto the renderer. And that performs a sequence of production functions itself. So first one, since the scene structure is hierarchical, you have like scene graph nodes and transforms and all these things. It needs to flatten it out first. And then it looks at the data and does sorting based on it to have correct render order going back to the front. And at the end, it might also include tools we use, like graphical widgets you can use to manipulate objects and these things. And it sends back an image that it produced through OpenGL, of course. And the scene view takes this image using JavaFX, presents that to the user. And so this is uh, a bit uh, one more of the, the complex ones. But the, the UI itself works a lot like this at all points. So all these different views, I talked about the center one right now, all these different ones, they, they continuously pull on the graph, of, uh, often through a node which sits like at the end of things. So there, there's not much happening after that. So they're at the end points pulling all the time on these values. And as soon as they see something change in the value, they update themselves. So looking at the outline, uh, it would look something like this, a regular closure data structure coming in describing what should be shown. And it's also hierarchical in this case, you see the children entry there. It's the same format repeating. And so the outline view will take this data, read through it and, and uh, create JavaFX widgets from this. So in this case, tree view items or whatever that might be. And using the icon and label here to uh, you know, uh, set the properties on them. And so this is stateful UI, of course, and this is the source of all these event storms that we talked about. And to get rid of that, we now just uh, throw away everything in this view whenever it changes. So we recreate from scratch all the time. And we had this bug before that made this happen at 60 FPS, but it, it happened at 60 FPS. So that tells you something about the performance of, of JavaFX. Um, Moving forward, uh, other cool stuff happens when you have this graph on your hands. And I'd just like to give you a, sh a quick demonstration ag uh, again about what might happen. So going back into the application here, I will undo. Now I flip the whole state of the graph back a few points. But as you see, we still have these dependencies. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so this hero is actually defined in a separate file. So we can inspect the hero in its isolation over here. Sorry. And the hero is composed of many other things. So here we have some death particles whenever he dies. And we have them over here. So we see these are now nodes, and the flow of computation is, is to the left for you. So this one sends this data down here, and it sends that data over here. So now we can peek back into this flow of data. So this was the file here. Now we see the contents here all of a sudden. And we also can expand into the particles. And that lets us start playing this right here when it's, where it's used, which is massively useful for uh, when you're making these particles. You get to see them in the context they're used in and so on. And I can even peek into this actually other file that's on a separate tab here, but change that in place. So that's what we mean by in-place editing. So I, mean, I might go in here and, of course, I want more blood because this game will not corrupt the young and be promoting violence and all that stuff that we're in the business to do. Um, so bloodbath is what I'm looking for, something like that. <laughs> um, and uh, let me just pause them so we, yeah, looks really good. And then I can, of course, run this again and, and have more corrupting of the young happening and, and you know, violence. <laughs> so uh, that's nice. Um, and all of this, of course, is you know, transacting on the graph and all that stuff that Mike just described. And it's, Really impressive how fast that can be done and that it's still a responsive application with all this stuff happening in the background. So that's fantastic. If I now uh, try to jump out again of things here, see that I misplaced the, uh, the HUD element. This is the like life uh, 
hard, so I'll just correct this, sorry. Like so, and let me try to go in. So here we have the, the hearts uh, representing the lives of the character. I happen to know that the, the hearts here are rendered through a GLSL shader that I have right here. And now I will uh, try to type in front of you, see how that goes. Um, now I'm changing the source of this shader to, to be hard-coded yellow. So whatever its texture is and everything, it will be hard-coded yellow in a second. Uh, like so. And then I, when I come back here, it's yellow. And, and the thing I did here is transacting on the graph, this invalidated forward all the way up into the view of this collection, which is dependent on this source. So whenever I clicked here, this now checks backwards again, whatever it might recompute, recompiles the shader, uploads it to the GPU, and it changes it. And what's even more interesting that just sort of happens here is that I, I can remove this line and undo. This is still on the graph. And then when I come back here, I can undo as well and change the source of it and have that visual. So the idea here is essentially to have a split, of course. You can see the source, you can see the result, and then live program the shaders and change everything. So it's a really, and this, this is just stuff that sort of happens. Like we were hoping this would happen for a long time and we never understood how it would happen really. But uh, in the end, it sort of did. And uh, it's really nice to not have to implement it, but just have it there and then you can choose to use it or how you want to present it to the user. Um, so that was the end of the demo. Uh, so some uh, conclusions here. Uh, so we managed to solve a lot of these problems that we identified up front, like the undo-redo problem. So, and it actually means that whatever transform someone else would introduce to this system, they don't need to deal with the reverse of that transform, and we will always undo it for them. Uh, actually, whether they want it or not, we will always be able to undo back and forth. We also have the 100% uh, correct cache invalidation, which is a very big statement to make, but it's simplified just by the fact that we know all the input parameters to every function, and we know precisely when they change, and are able then to not do it redundantly often or anything like that. It's very precise and nice, works really great. Uh, lines of code, I don't think that's a surprise to you in this community, but to me it was just ridiculous how much you could express in, in uh, ridiculously uh, little code. And also we found that JavaFX was a requirement even because it had that level of performance that let us just be wasteful with the widgets and just totally remake them from scratch and, and have that more like functional behavior going on. But I think another revelation was that in the light of all this, we sort of realized that the old application indeed had a computational graph working much like this one it was just horribly implemented, like the, the worst kind of way you could ever express such a situation. So rather than having the node, a node with an edge in between them, that would be described in the old system by an if statement checking a flow of events and then doing arbitrary code as a response to that. And then you have the problem as a, as a tool developer to, like you, you can't really inspect that, you can't do anything, you can't analyze it, you can't do anything with it. Um, it's just there, and it doesn't clearly describe this relationship to anyone looking at the code. You have to understand it to actually see that connection. But whereas now, when we have the explicit data flow inside of the graph and in data, we can make really simple decisions based on it. So we can detect that you might have a thousand files, but you're only using 500 of them in your game, which means that we only compile those 500 files, decrease the bundle size of the game, and it just sort, it's sort of there. Like, we don't need to do all these kind of uh, really complicated things about it. We just look at it and see, okay, this is everything we need. Actually, compiling the data now is pulling on an output. Like that triggers the whole looking back in the graph. So it's, there's not even code to do this pruning. Like it's just following the arcs and whatever is connected happened to be in included in the building. So that helped a big deal for us. Uh, and it, it made all this uh, <laughs> worth the effort of <laughs> doing this whole project. And we also would like to take the time to thank some people. And uh, Christian Murray, who is my boss, he was the uh, person behind this uh, ID to use uh, a graph and a functional language and, and closure. So he made a connection with the Cognitech happen. He also convinced King to pay for it, which was a really great achievement. Uh, so we could even do this since they, they had the working software and we're still, you know, uh, wanted to see this happen. 
And also a bunch of people from Cognitech, Dan, Sam, Stuart and Karen, who helped with design and implementation. And also Eric, my colleague, who is now implementing this, this editor. So I think that makes us ready for uh, questions. <laughs>